thinking of starting a nonprofit animal rescue? I have a special treat for you today. In this video, we will recap the steps to starting a nonprofit and then hear directly from the founder and executive director of a successful nonprofit animal rescue for tips on how to get going when you are just starting up. Watch out for some puppy cameos. Welcome or welcome back. My name is Amber Melanie Smith and I'm a nonprofit founder and executive director who makes these videos here on YouTube to help folks like you who want to make a difference in the world. Whether that's through starting a nonprofit or social enterprise or socially conscious business or being a leader in your community or other ways to make an impact. I hope you find this useful and helpful and probably cute today because uh, we're going to see some puppies here in a minute. Um, don't forget to give this video a like and subscribe to my channel for more content like this. Also, if you are looking for resources and tips on your making an impact journey, possibly as a nonprofit leader or other type of community uh, leader, don't forget to check out my newsletter. It's linked right below this video in the description. I send out funding opportunities and resources and tips and updates on things that are going on. So you definitely want to be a part of that newsletter. And of course, you can opt out anytime. All that out of the way, let's go check out our friends at this animal rescue that I want to introduce you to. Tucked away in the town of Wake Forest, North Carolina is a vibrant, colorful animal rescue shelter saving grace animals for adoption i first heard of saving grace when i went looking for my own fur baby to adopt everyone i asked said you've got to try saving grace over the years they've built up a strong local reputation for matching dogs with forever families sure enough saving grace is where i found my best furry friend kira about five years ago look at her she's so cute i love her so much saving grace began in 2004 at a private residence and farm and has since placed over 30,000 animals let's take a look now, quick interjection here. In this video, I'm not gonna go into a lot of detail about the legal steps of how to form a 501c3 nonprofit organization in the United States. And that's just because I've done that in a couple of other videos. If you're looking for some of that information, definitely check out my other video called How to Start a Nonprofit and Succeed for the more in-depth process there. But I will do a quick recap checklist here just to make sure that we are up to date on a high level for that stuff. Let's do that real quick. Real quick, here is the checklist for the steps to form a nonprofit in the United States. Of course, some of these steps might be changed around in order based on your particular region, so always check with your regional laws. But quick checklist, number one, assemble your board of directors. Make sure you have the correct number of board members according to state law. Make sure you're finding people based on skills for that you need for the next couple of years for your organization. Two, choose a name. Make sure it's not already picked by another corporation. Three, write your bylaws, which are your governing documents. Four, have a board meeting with your new board of directors where you vote on your bylaws and be sure to take minutes. Five, file your articles of incorporation for your state. And six, apply for federal tax exemption as a 501c3. You're gonna be using Form 1023. I'm here with Molly Goldston, founder and executive director of Saving Grace. I'm so excited to have you all hear from her today and hear her story. So Molly, tell us a little bit more about how you got started, when you got started, and what Saving Grace is all about. So I got started right out of college about 2001 when I graduated college and of all the things I could go pick and do as far as where to work, I went to the local animal shelter, which was also animal control at the time in Wake County. And um, I learned so much about sheltering and animals and adoption and saw the big need uh, you know at that time there wasn't as many rescues and opportunities for adoption and there wasn't as many shelters that were really focused on adoption as much as just animal control so I saw so many people who were looking to adopt a, a good companion family dog but we didn't really know a lot about them um, and the shelter wasn't really a friendly easy place to visit 
So I started Saving Grace just to have a place where people could come and visit and adopt. That's amazing. Mm -hmm. And so let's get a little bit more into the status of the organization now. Fast forward several years. Um, what kind of help do you have? Do you have staff? How many staff? Volunteers? So we currently have 10 full-time staff. That's we amazing. have five part-time and we have about 400 volunteers. Yeah, about 400 active volunteers. And that's everybody from the people that are on site each day caring for the dogs. We have two shifts a day just for dog care. So that starts first thing in the morning. They're rotated out in play groups. They get all their medication. Um, they get fed, all of, all of that care. And then another shift in the afternoon. So those people are everybody from who actually has hands-on time with the dogs to a lot of behind the scenes people. I think probably people have no idea how much behind the scenes work it actually takes to keep everybody's medical records up, oh, yeah. posted on the website, coordinating our transports, just who's gonna go to different vet clinics each day or go to events, go to shelters, you know, picking them up from different shelters. So there's a lot behind the scenes that take it, it takes to run a shelter. I can imagine. So I know that I've covered starting a nonprofit in several of my other videos, the legal steps, etc. But starting an animal rescue nonprofit has got to be kind of different from mm -hmm. other types of nonprofits. So I'd love to hear more from you about your experience with that. What are some of the special considerations that people who might be thinking of start, starting an animal rescue might need to have from legal, permitting, insurance, special training for your board and volunteers? Yeah. Just walk me through it. So it really depends on, well, I guess there's two parts of it. There's what you want to do, like what is your mission? There's in our area in North Carolina we are still the third highest euthanasia in the country so we still have a huge overpopulation problem um, so what we try to do at Saving Grace is find the most adoptable dogs who are going to be a really successful family member and that not only has you know sets them and the family up for success but it also encourages a lot of other people to adopt because they see just how many great how many great dogs there are a lot of people think oh shelter animals have issues or they were brought in for behavior problems that might be the case in some areas where they don't have an overpopulation problem so in North Carolina that's just not it for us I mean we just have so many nice animals that are just the product of not spaying and neutering and not having any sort of guidelines regarding or um, enforcing spay neuter in our state so that's for the shelters and also for citizens so some states some states do and they've really gotten a lot of the uh, unwanted pets um, they've really minimized that so our goal is to look for the most adoptable and, and try to identify those and get those into homes. So somebody in another state might have a different mission. They might want to work with dogs who, you know, are fearful or maybe who have medical needs or something different. So I think just determining what is going to be your goal and what's going to be your mission here um, is really important. And then there are some guidelines and laws in the state and those vary with each each state so finding out what you have to be accountable for is really important so in North Carolina there's really not a lot that we wouldn't comply with anyway um, we want to make sure that you know we don't have dogs in conditions that aren't humane and that we provide all the necessary care you know that they have water 24 hours a day and they have a dry clean space to live and they have enough interaction with people. So those are all um, things that we would do anyway. We've also had to, you know, insurance has always been an issue as far as making sure that you're covered not only with the people coming to Saving Grace, but when we go out and about mm. to events or for different drivers who are, are going on transports or taking dogs different places. Um, so we had to get insurance for all of that and not every insurance carrier wants to insure you but there are some out there you know and it is not cheap um trying to factor all of that into your fundraising and your budget is really important mm -hmm. so 
you know a lot of times people are like why is your adoption fee so much well it doesn't just cover the medical care your animal got it covers all the services that it took to get an animal to you so that's really exciting because what she just described is assessing your true costs and that's what yeah. we've talked about in a few other videos is it's not overhead it's part of what she needs to do in order to carry out the rest of her mission so right. thank you good job yeah. <laughs> um, so okay so we, we talked about some special legal considerations mm -hmm. some insurance um, what else what else do people considering starting a nonprofit animal rescue need to consider I think one of the best things that I did was work for a shelter, mm -hmm. a county shelter before I ever started Saving Grace. I worked for a county shelter and I also worked doing a lot of um, dog training and some behavior yes. work. And so I got to see from the county side just how um, their position too. So. Our main partners are different counties that don't have adoption programs and they rely on their, their dogs to come to Saving Grace to have a chance for adoption. And that's true with a lot of shelters all over you know, the United States is we want to partner with the rescues, but the rescues also have to know just what those people are up against. Right. So knowing that you're gonna get dogs that you might not know a lot about, um, knowing that they are not they are not at the leisure of holding until you have a foster so it's up to you to say you know crank it up and find more fosters or say you know we can't accommodate those which is always you know sad there's always more dogs than we can accommodate but um, you know also knowing the the county or state requirements so that you can adopt out under the same um, rules as, as they are required to enforce so I'm really glad that I got to know from their side what they deal with and also I think a lot of times they feel a lot of judgment because you know we do have a lot of euthanasia still in North Carolina and I I don't hold them it's not their fault it's not the shelter's fault because our state has not enforced spay neuter they really are the ones cleaning up the problem so i think they get um they 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 are they receive a lot of negativity sometimes about what happens in shelters and it's not it's not them so i want them to know that we're going to work with them and do the best we can for as many dogs as we can together yeah. so um i'm really glad that i worked at a shelter first Right. So having that real life experience, mm -hmm. knowing what it's like, uh, good for you, I'm sure good for your volunteers too and your staff. Yes. Yes. So we have a lot of people who volunteer and they have to come on site and do an orientation. And so they learn all about Saving Grace, just kind of get an overview. And then the ones who are going to work on site, they get paired with a mentor for two different days. So two different sessions, they come out and they learn how to do everything as far as the feeding the cleaning that sort of thing and they are always paired with somebody who's going to know know what to do if, if there's um you know a situation that they might not that they might know they're going to be with somebody who does know um and we have a spay neuter clinic so we have a veterinarian on site and we have people who come in and volunteer there as well and so they have a tech that they work with that makes sure they are trained and know how to um you know care for each animal after surgery it's like a one-stop shop it is so <laughs> and and like I said there's it takes everything from events and fundraising so if there's somebody who doesn't want to be on site caring for the dogs then we match them with somebody who can help them and train them to do what they're interested in doing all right obviously you have done an amazing job growing this organization over several years but think back to when you were just starting out and think of other people who might be in your position how would someone go about raising money as a nonprofit animal rescue startup so there is never enough funds for what we need to do um when i first started out i was doing a lot more of the adoptions the one-on-one -on -one too and so i always made a note to remember 
what that person did. Mm. Um, you know, now I don't do as much as the one-on-one -on -one adoptions with people coming in. But when I was doing a, the adoptions and meeting a lot of visitors to Saving Grace, I always, you know, had a conversation with them and just got to know them, like what their lifestyle is, trying to find a good dog for them. And I often would remember, oh, well, they work in marketing or they have an events business or, you know, so I would make a note because anybody who adopts, they have a lot more invested in us, uh, emotional right. investment. They're usually really grateful for their dog and the journey that they had at Saving Grace to, to bring them together. So they are usually really willing to help us if I reach out with a need and say, you know, I have this need, can you help me? Or people who really loved certain breeds, you mm -hmm. know, like, I have some beagle lovers. If I get a dog in that's injured, like a beagle that's injured, being able to say, you know, I have this little dog that your type of dog, even though you can't adopt it, could you sponsor? And remembering people personally, there's, there's a lot more people now. So that's really hard. But to get me to that point, I think having the personal connection with a lot of people was really important and helped me get that far. So... I really hope people know still now, even though I might not talk to them personally or as an individual, we get a lot more donations now because we have a lot more animals that we're caring for. So I hope they will always know though that their donations really do make a specific impact. And we try to do a lot of storytelling and nothing, like we don't do as nearly as many stories as there could be. Like every day, all day, there's really great stories of dogs coming in that, you know, have had nobody ever love them and no care. And then they get really great homes, you know. So yeah. I hope our donors can see just a little piece of that just to see what the, a difference they make. And even though they might not be able to come out and volunteer on site, you know, their gifts are just as important to, to bring the full adoption journey you know, together for these dogs because we have people who can come out on site but not, you know, don't have the funds to, to give. And then we have people who give and, you know, might not be able to come out. So making everybody understand just how their piece is important. Yeah. I think. I'm having an emotional reaction right now. So I know that that would work for lots of donors. And yeah. I think what you said is perfectly spot on. You know, it's all about that relationship building. It's getting to know, making people feel human and connected to the mission. And so when you're getting to know these people and building relationships back when you were starting out, did you eventually get some kind of like fundraising uh, donor database to start keeping track of all the notes that were in your head? Oh, I need to do that. Um, yeah. So we have a <laughs> fundraising team so I have some people who help like just with the thank you notes and then some people who help us as far as keeping you know our software up to date for how to give and that is something that I think we definitely need to work on is being able to have more of the one-on-one -on -one, um, relationships that I used to have and I still have a lot of them yeah but there's a lot of room that we could um, improve too so so it takes a team. I think it definitely takes a team. And we've found some people that have a lot of fundraising experience as far as being able to help me keep it organized and make sure we get our newsletters out on time and that our stories are getting out. Because when you're the one that's actually working in the middle of it, it's all you can do just to take care of everybody some, sometimes. Yeah. So having those people that can help you put it together to, to get it out, whether it's social media or newsletters, um, we have definitely found that different avenues reach different people. So like one story you want to send out through Instagram and, and TikTok are going to reach somebody that is not going to see that if you mail something right. Right. so trying to reach all of those people is something that we have really tried to uh, make sure we do because you know our older donors they rely on mail the mail yep mm -hmm. um we have a lot that look at email that might not look at mail or instagram and social media so we try to cover all of those things yeah. segmentation Okay, so let's talk some logistics. You know, you've helped so many animals mm -hmm. at this point. How do you find all the animals? It is not a problem. They <laughs> just flock. 
Uh, there are so many. They flock to Saving Grace, it feels like. So maybe not the animals as much as the people who are seeking help. So yeah. we work mostly with North Carolina, some South Carolina shelters. We work with the most rural shelters, the most underserved. Okay. So I really want to be able to reach out to those shelters who have nobody. Some of the shelters I go to, I am the only person going in there as far as a rescue partner. So I want to reach out to those because I think those dogs need the most help or the biggest chance to, to be adopted. And so I go and I visit and some days I go in and there might be um, 50 to 100 dogs and I might have five spaces to bring dogs and I'll just have to choose who is the, the most adoptable, you know, who gets along with other dogs, who's friendly to people. And it, it depends on how many adoptions we've had. So it's always important, um, you know, that's why we always are preaching adopt, you know, choose adoption, because not only are you adopting and rescuing the dog that you're taking home that day, but it also opens up a, a, a place right. at Saving Grace where a dog comes from a shelter. So there's always, there's always dogs waiting for a spot here. So I go to those shelters and go through the dogs and choose who's going to be the best fit for our program. So at Saving Grace, you have to be dog friendly. You have to be able to get along with the other dogs co-housing you have to be able to be safe with people we have lots of people in and out and we want to make sure that we're giving dogs um you know setting our adopters up for a really great experience too to get a dog who's going to be friendly and and be able to join into their lifestyle and most people want to get a dog that they can take with them to um, sporting events yeah. or walks or you know be part of their neighborhood so we really try to focus on choosing those dogs and there are more than I can ever bring to Saving Grace. So we partner with about 20 different shelters and I just go there and visit with them and I get calls every day, all day from these shelters oh saying, gosh. can you come yet? Can you come yet? Because they really want their dogs to have a chance to be a Saving Grace dog. Um, you know, and they have to make decisions there on how long they can keep their dogs because there's more coming in right behind them. So, um, Getting dogs is not a problem. And when you were first starting out, mm -hmm. how did you find the animals that you were gonna help? So I just went to the shelters and I said, this is me, this is what I'm doing. Um, would you like for me to work with, with uh, your dogs and see if there's anybody who might be a fit for our program? I had several veterinarians write letters for me. So oh, saying- it's a good idea. Yeah, so just a reference letter saying that, you know, she's somebody who's going to take care of the dog and do a, you know, be responsible as far as placing them, providing spay neuter, medical care. So I had a, a reference letter and that I would take with me and also a 501c3. So once I got my letter, I think that took about six months yeah. to get the letter and a reference from a vet, they were really happy to have a place help them. So, mm -hmm. So I actually think that's a really great segue into partnerships and collaborations. You know, it's clear from hearing you speak that that's a really important aspect mm -hmm. of a lot of what you do. So talk more about how you're forming these partnerships, especially from the perspectives of someone who might just be starting out. So, well, we work a lot with the counties. So those are the, those are the facilities that are bringing in all the strays or the surrenders. We also work a lot with the different organizations, the smaller rescues, so in our community. And that's a lot of times, like maybe we have somebody who wants to donate a truckload of food to us. And it, it feels like a lot of times we either have so much of something right. or we have nothing, you know? So it's <laughs> right. like, we are out of food and we make an ask to the community and then we get, you know, all this food donated. And then like a week later, a big food company ca calls and is like, hey, can you take a ship shipment of food? And we might not have room, but having connections with people in our community that might be a smaller organization that, you know, doesn't really have a, a reputation yet for some of these big companies who want to donate a truckload of food, food trying to keep um, our resources kind of piled together or pulled together yeah. in the community so that we can share has definitely worked really well I think for us and for the smaller rescues who might not you know again be able to accept a donation that um, you know is more than they can handle but we could split it among different ones um, or sometimes you know there will be like a dog that we get in at Saving Grace that jumps a fence so we can't really 
have a dog, I mean we can that jumps fences, but it doesn't really get out a lot. Um, you know, a lot of our, our volunteers, they uh, might take dogs for, for walks, but by far most of our dogs get all of their exercise just by being out in the fenced areas. Mm -hmm. So we might do like a trade with another shelter that's only indoors and doesn't have outdoor spaces. And so that dog is more likely to get adopted there. So maybe like a, a shelter in town um, in a busy city. So where people only walk their dogs on a leash. So that dog might get adopted there. And, you know, we could swap them for one that maybe, you know, needs a yard and needs more exercise. So I think... Um, Definitely as the years have gone on and people have become more aware of each other and pulling the resources together, that's been that's been really great. And there's also um, a lot of effort to, to move some of our southern dogs to the northeast. Okay. They have hmm. a lot of spay neuter laws up there and so there's not the overpopulation that there is here in the southeast. So, you know, sometimes if we have a dog, like I said, that would do better in a city, then we might all get together and send 20 dogs on, on one trip um, to the Northeast. So, you know, I might not have 20 dogs to send, somebody else might not have 20 dogs to send, but to be able to help the most dogs, we want to send all 20. So we'll pull, pull together and make that sort of thing happen. So definitely reach out to different organizations and say, this is me, this is, you know, I'm here, this is what I have, and this is what we need. So if they get things they can't use they can let us know too it's like nonprofit go fish it really is it really <laughs> is i mean and, and there's people you know who have all kinds of resources that that they offer and, and ask and maybe it's something we can't use but somebody else can yeah and i love that yeah. and, and what you were talking about earlier about sending dogs to the northeast i think that's a really great example of how you say going upstream to try to tackle the problem sort of more on a systems level, you know, that yeah. plus maybe advocating for policy for that spay and neuter stuff here. Um, that combined with the day-to-day -day matching of the animals to their forever homes, I think that's how you're able to make a really big impact. Yeah. And we bring, you know, a dog back sometimes, like a, a lot of, uh, some dog rescues are just a specific breed so like right. there's beagle rescue or there's german shepherd rescue so you know i might see a dog in a shelter that's two or three hours away and i'm there and i see a dog that would fit their program and say you know hey can you take this dog because if you can take this dog then i can take one of the mutts over here so yeah. just trying to pull together so we can help the most um the most get the care they need i love that yeah and we also refer people to to adopt other places you know if they come to saving grace and there's not a dog that they find which is absolutely okay we give them a list of other places to visit because we want them to rescue a dog it doesn't matter if it's with us or another organization as long as they give a dog a home that needs one yeah all right so for you folks if you're thinking of starting a nonprofit animal rescue Let's just talk about general advice on overcoming some of the unique challenges, advice for startups, et cetera. So I think um, just have a realistic expectation of how much work it's gonna take and how long it's gonna take for you to establish the relationships and um, you know, and have an established organization because it takes a really, it takes a long time and um, a lot more work than I think you probably would really expect especially when it's animals because they get sick 24 7 365 days a year so you can definitely go on vacation a lot of people are like do you ever get a break yes but not until i had a really good team established could i really take a break um so now that i have a good team established i have somebody who can answer and say you know, well, let, I'll help you with this dog that's in an emergency because emergencies happen all the time. Um, and it's always, uh, you know, you, you have to help that dog at that time. So, um, yeah, so having, having the needs and I think also the funds to be able to help in an emergency. In the beginning, that was hard because it was like, okay, you know, we're just trying to, to go week to week and make sure everybody's had the medication and um, the needs they had and you know I couldn't consider myself an employee for about 
the first 10 years. It yeah. took about 10 years. So if you want to do it full time, then, um, you know, having the expectation that it's going to take a lot of time before you can actually support yourself doing it, um, I think is really important. So once I got to that point, we, um, you know, have a lot of different incomes, um, a lot of different avenues they come in. So whether it's people who want to support each animal, mm -hmm. um, you know, like you can go on our website and choose a dog that you want to support for um, everything from like a $6 vaccine all the way up to a $1,000 for a heartworm treatment. So finding different price points, I think, for people to be able to give and identify something for them to actually um, associate that their gift mattered. You know, when we break it down and say your $6 uh, gift paid for a vaccine for a dog yeah. um, and kind of help people understand like just how much each thing cost it really makes them feel like they gave a specific dog something and they did um they did so kind of breaking that down and then having like we do like our calendar so people can buy a calendar That's each year <laughs> yep so you can put your either your dog's picture in there on a day or either the whole month so that again has different price points for different people and um you know we have our store so that is a really great um thing that gives back to our dogs because when people get a new dog the first thing they do is go and get all their supplies and I was seeing all of them you know go to some of the big chains and get their supplies which is fine but we were able to eventually set up a store where not only can we get those proceeds back towards our animals but we also have people there who are really familiar with our dogs and the adoption process and kind of help the adopter with what do you really need for this dog versus what you don't need you know right. so instead of buying a big fluffy bed let's just start with you know some blankets and, and see how that goes and see how they can treat their stuff as far as chewing it or you know accidents and, and getting them acclimated so the store was really great and um you know like at christmas and for birthdays we encourage people to do a, a donation in honor or in memory um also when people pass away um some people want to work with us especially before they pass away and a lot of times legacy given I think is hard for people to bring up because nobody wants yeah. to talk about well when you're gonna die can you help us out through that but people are really open to it if you say you know this is how you can make a difference to animals so providing them with um, ways to make an impact through you know everything through what you're doing now day to day or even after they pass away people like that you are going to show them that their life mattered so approaching it from different ways is always really interesting too and I think well received by most yeah giving each person sort of the unique personalized a personalized way to give yes yeah amazing all right, Molly, so how can someone support your amazing mission here at Saving Grace? So they can adopt, volunteer, or donate, and um, uh, lots of other ways to sponsor us. And they can find out all that information on our website at savinggracenc.org and also our social medias, which is Saving Grace NC. I hope that you're inspired by Molly's story and all of the impact that she's been able to make so far. If you're thinking of starting a nonprofit animal rescue, definitely you know, take a chance to reflect on all that she's shared and think about how you might be able to you know, assess the needs in your community and make an impact in your own way too. I hope that you found this useful. Don't forget to give it a like and subscribe, of course, as I mentioned before. And don't forget to join my newsletter linked below. If you are starting a nonprofit, need additional helps on the steps, or developing a sustainable fundraising plan, check out my website, foundertofulltime.com, where I have online trainings that can help you out with that. And of course, check out my online community at Change the World or Bust. Um, it's currently on Facebook. You can join us there. We've got several thousand people from around the world making an impact and I hope you can join us. See you next time. Bye.